it's time to get started. Let's start. 137, Joy to the World. 137. And I'll let you remain seated. It's Wednesday night. Night. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us. sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks hills and plains repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more the sins and sorrows from, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. to one more song in just a minute, but I just want to uh, be in prayer for Pastor down in uh, Florida it, and during the 80 degree weather. It's so tough down there. And uh, so uh, having a good time putting a Band-Aid on my brother's boo-boo and um, some other things as well. So it's been good. Um, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll open up the service. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being here, the, the, that we can be here tonight uh, and uh, fellowship around your word. I pray that you'd be with us. Your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, challenge us through uh, the teaching of your word. And Lord, I pray that um, uh, as we bring our requests boldly before your throne, that you would hear us, that be nothing in the way that would hinder our prayers from uh, coming to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, number 139, Born to Die. Number 139. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were.
path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambitions I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Thank you for being here tonight, and I know that we have some sick folks. We'll get to those in just a minute, but I wanted to just take a minute to mention some of the uh, missionary letters that we uh, got. Um, I got an update from Ernia. Oh, Ernia. <laughs> Ernia. Ernia. There we go. The end. Ernie and Lydia. There we go. Ernie Ensign. And uh, doing well, but um, be in prayer for them. They had to, um, of course, uh, they've been off of the field uh, since the beginning of the year and um, didn't know for sure whether or not they were going to go back. And uh, basically, they can't go back. Um, the restrictions in Korea, in South Korea, are so... Um, uh, are so intense that their family of 10 cannot go go anywhere together. And uh, so um, and he was telling me some about this stuff. So be in prayer for him. Their family, and we need to be in prayer about what we can do about this. Um, their family is living in a 30-foot fifth wheel. And he sent me the pictures they are literally stacked on one another. Uh, and I told him, brother, I know, I, well, I don't know, I don't know it that bad. Because <laughs> you know, we didn't have 10, because five was enough. Uh, and our fifth wheel was 30 feet, and it was tight. And so I can't even imagine. And he has, uh, he explained that he had uh, gotten a piece of property years ago, back in 2014, I think it was, so that it, if anything happened to him, uh, Lydia and the kids can move back and have a piece of property to do something with. And right now, he's uh, building an off-the-grid homestead. Let me just put it that way. And um, so we need to be in prayer for him. So that's uh, pretty much the update. They were able to um, get things situated over in North Korea. I didn't know this. Um, he mentions here in his letter the deposit to rent the deposit to rent is $10,000, and that's on the low end. He, can, he said it's sometimes sixty to 70000 just for the deposit to rent. And so it's like you might as well be buying the house. But um, So be in prayer for them. They are down in Tennessee right now, and so be in prayer for them. And that's pretty much the update that he explains in his letter. We got an update from the Wallace family, and uh, uh, Brother Mike and Mary were here not long ago, and we praise the Lord for them and the work that they're doing. They said that um, they have seen, uh, they say praise the Lord that several received Christ January 6th when most Mexicans exchanged gift, not on Christmas. Well, we plan to give out Christmas joy gift bags and preach the gospel. We pray that this would be successful with many saved. And so uh, be in prayer for them uh, on January 6th is when they celebrate the giving of gifts and so forth. And so be in prayer for them as they uh, get prepared for that and uh, witnessing uh, to folks. They also mentioned a lady named Maria. They say this, a lady named Maria in her mid-70s uh, picked up one of our gospel tracts that someone had thrown down. She read it, then called me asking about our church. I told her that we would pass by for her on Wednesday, but when I drove by that night, 
I didn't see her waiting. When we arrived at church, Maria called me and asked where the bus was. I told her we just arrived at church, and I had to start the service, but invited her to come Sunday instead. She was very insistent, so I passed the phone to someone else in her church, and I started uh, the service. Maria was persistent to get uh, the exact location of the church, and she showed up just in time for the preaching. After hearing the gospel again after the service, Maria bowed her head and called on Jesus to save her. So praise the Lord for that. And then uh, in the uh, next part, he talks about how his wife visited a Jewish lady named Elizabeth. And um, says, uh, when I picked up Mary later, after the visit was done, she shared with uh, me what had happened during their conversation. Elizabeth, Elizabeth came right out and asked Mary how she, she became a Christian and what does it mean to be a Christian. And Mary shared her testimony completely, witnessing to her and reminding Elizabeth that Jesus was a Jew, and for that reason, true Christians love the Jewish people. Elizabeth's husband, Jacob, was listening in the other room and came out and thanked Mary for coming. He gave Mary the kosher bread that they just had blessed and had uh, bought for the following day, which was the Sabbath. So please pray for their family that they would receive Jesus Christ. And apparently there's other Jews living in the area. So be in prayer for those things. The final prayer request that he has, he says, Mary has had a problem with her jaw for over two months where she has severe pain and can only eat soft things like yogurt and soup. So be in prayer for her with that condition. Next prayer letter from uh, Keith Hamilton. I've got a number here. I probably won't read them all. All of these will be updated on the website, so you'll be able to find them. Oh, and by the way, when you go to the website and sign up, because you have to uh, sign up uh, to get access to these emails, um, the new emails that we receive, I put a green check mark by. And so pretty much I tried to do this like on Mondays and get those updated so the old ones will lose their green check mark and then all the new ones will have a green check mark. So be sure to go over to the website and check that out. I've had several people contact me and signed up and that's great and I'm, uh, I'm thankful for that. The Hamiltons. Um, September, as summer ended, homeschool began. Kelly and the boys got off to a great start. The boys are thankful to get back into their school schedule again. They absolutely love it. And then the fifth, the first Sunday in church, I presented to our people missions organization as helping refugees who are fleeing Afghanistan and getting the gospel to him. The organization was recommended by a missionary, friend Edgar Figali is his name, and they give 100% of the money they received directly to the cause. I was delighted to see our church give over $2,700 to this need. And this month, we begin two new and exciting opportunities to learn the Bible in our Sunday school Bible class. We're learning Old Testament history, and in our Bible study, we're going through the book of Genesis. Unfortunately, not all the people returned after the COVID lockdowns. Two families and a single man have not returned, but we did have uh, one student return who was taking business classes in Limerick. At the end of the month, we celebrated our youngest son's 10th birthday. October, the month started with holiday uh, home rental, a holiday home rental in um, Kokeri. Uh, which we purchased years ago but had to keep rescheduling due to lockdowns. This time we were able to make it, finally get, uh, got to have some needed time away as a family. Uh, during the time, we had Tom Baker fill in, us, in for us. He is a lad from an IBC in Ireland who finished seminary and had did a great job teaching on Ephesus and preaching on Revelation 2. Um, I wanted to skip down here. Um, their soul winning, he says, we continually, we continue our weekly soul winning program, getting the gospel to hundreds on the weekends. God bless his faithfulness at the end of October when the Romanian family 
visited, when a Romanian family visited, the wife raised her hand for salvation in the invitation. Then while she was talking to my wife after the service, she told her that she wanted to be saved. Kelly sat down with her and opened the Bible, explained that God's plan to redeem mankind from hell, and the wife prayed and trusted the Lord as her Savior. Um, so praise the Lord for that. There's a Romanian family that had been coming to their church, and uh, this lady got saved. So uh, be in prayer for uh, Brother Hamilton, and I'm um, there in Ireland, and the work that God's doing. Um, let's see here. Um, if you remember Brother Lawrence, uh, did we take him on for support? I don't think we did. We take him on for support. Uh, Lawrence Bowman said uh, he, he gives a great update um, here. He says um, several times each week I visit neighborhoods where Satan has a stronghold in gang activity. He says my heart is burdened for these young men and boys. They must hear the gospel that Jesus loves and cares for them. He says, though I've only met about 75 gang members out of the estimated 60,000 who live in El Salvador, most of these young men have kindly given me some, some of their time to share the gospel with them from uh, my Bible. My time with them is crucial. I try to be a true friend, something they, someone they can trust. My friendship with them is important to me because I want to encourage and serve them in their many needs so that one day they can learn to humbly walk with God. They listen, but when confronted to make decisions to follow Christ right now, they respond, it's beautiful what you teach from the Bible, but tomorrow. And so pray for these young men that the Lord would um, really get a hold of their hearts. It could uh, go a long way to see uh, these young men uh, get saved and get some of their peers. That's a, that's a tough, tough um, field to be trying to reach. And so pray that the Holy Spirit softens the hearts of these young men. He says, a month ago we were able to bring uh, begin a weekly youth club on Saturday evenings. Youth can get off the streets and play games, enjoy good food, learn practical, important Bible lessons for their lives. I'm really enjoying this and happy that I have this opportunity, uh, important ministry. I'm only surprised that more teenage boys are attending than young ladies. But may God raise these youths up to be servants of Jehovah God. So pray in prayer for Brother Bowman and his uh, mission there uh, in El Salvador. And one more here, uh, Nate Shaver. Schaefer, the, the Schaefer family, excuse me, um, <clears throat> says that October was the busiest month we've had. We had nine scheduled meetings this month for missions conference. We ended up in 11 different churches hearing 28 sermons and drove 15 through 15 states to accomplish this. And we are also blessed to have five churches take us on for monthly support. <clears throat> and... Um, so be in prayer for them. Basically, they've been traveling a lot. Pray for uh, wisdom. The, he says, uh, pray for wisdom on whether or not to take a trip to Iceland soon. Uh, pray for the 20, uh, 2022 calendar to fill up. Uh, Rachel's um, expecting, and so pray for that. The due date is around January 1st, so that's coming up. And I have a list of, he says, I have a list of things that need to be accomplished this winter before our eventual, eventual move to Iceland. And praise the Lord for five uh, new supporting churches and two, conference, and two conferences they were able to attend. So uh, be in prayer for the Shavers as they uh, get closer to going to Iceland. And then uh, Adam Wells, the missionary to the deaf, it gives us an update. Fall quarter here in eastern Tennessee has been a really good one. Though my family began the quarter dealing with the pandemic, the Lord was gracious to us all. In a few weeks, we we're back up to speed. Since then, we have enjoyed the opportunity to minister here and there, sharing the gospel, presenting our work wherever we go. Our ministry at home, at our home church this quarter involved along with teaching my adult deaf Sunday school class, my administrative duties. We saw a deaf teenager saved in October. 
and we continue to pray and reach out to the younger deaf in any way we can. A revival meeting in November was especially memorable this year, and our church is really enjoying a sweet spirit over the past few months. Our prayer is that this will lead to real growth and faithfulness in our members, and the Lord will use our church more and more until he comes for us. The college work this quarter included a fantastic Genesis class where we had time to really uh, delve into uh, some spiritual application and typology along with real history of the book. And he says, next semester I will be teaching the book of Numbers. And so be in prayer for, uh, he says, uh, prayer for... Um, uh, be in prayer for them as they travel to uh, South Carolina this month. He doesn't say exactly when. Uh, if, <laughs> he could have already traveled. Don't know, but I think it, 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 it's coming up, uh, presumably. God's leading in our 2022 schedule. Uh, pray for the Sword Deaf Baptist, uh, Baptist Church and the Sword Deaf Baptist College students. And that the Lord calls more deaf preachers to train. Okay, so be in prayer for uh, the Wells family. Okay, let's go ahead and have another song, and then we'll get to prayer requests. And uh, let's see here. Let's go to a number 100, 141. It came upon a midnight clear. 141. on the last for lo the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold the ever circling years comes round the age of gold when peace shall over all the earth it's a and splendor sling, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. Okay, prayer request tonight. I know Monique is not feeling well, so be in prayer for her. And uh, be in prayer for uh, Miss Laura. She came on Sunday. She was that black lady uh, that came on Sunday on the bus, and she is looking for a place to live right now. And so uh, be in prayer for her in that search. And I, uh, she told me, and I didn't quite catch it, if it was her daughter or her sister, I believe it was her daughter, who's uh, been taken to the emergency room, and I never got a name from her. I, I, I asked her who it was, but I never got a name. But just be in prayer for Laura and her daughter. Okay, prayer request tonight. Yes, sir. Okay, and the other two, 
their names? Okay. Um, oh, on that note, I talked to uh, Dean, uh, Dean Fry, Dean and Sandy Fry, and they both have COVID too. Um, Dean, uh, uh, Sandy went for uh, the uh, monoclonal antibody treatments um, a few days ago, and she's feeling better. And uh, Dean is supposed to go on Friday, so just be in prayer for them. And uh, Dean has had uh, some. Uh, health issues, especially with his heart. Um, so just pray in prayer for them. They seem to be, he seemed to be doing okay. He was eating breakfast when I talked to him this morning. And so just pray in prayer for them. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Forney. Are you talking about Audrey Winstead? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Hartsfeld. Is Hartzell? Okay. Okay, uh, Joy, did, would, did you have your hand up? Okay. Yes, ma'am.
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Someone else? Anybody else? Yes, sir? Being prayer for Beth Ann, Schreckengost, uh, with the chemo treatments of cancer. Yes, sir. Hmm. What was her last name? Kressler. Okay, anybody else? Anything else? Yes, ma'am. family. Okay. Anything else you need to mention? We need to pray for this nation and uh, a lot going on right now. And uh, our, of course, our confidence is never in the government. And uh, it needs to be placed in God and stay there. And so we'll be in prayer for our nation. Okay, anything else that we need to mention tonight? All right, we'll go ahead and get uh, to our Bible study. Thank you, Brother Dave. Take your Bibles, if you would, go to Matthew Chapter 2, we're going to start there. this thing on. No, I didn't. Okay. All right, you got me here? Good. All right, Matthew uh, chapter number two. And uh, actually, we're going to back up to, to, to chapter 1, and then we'll come into chapter 2. We're going to see a couple things. We're going to go to Isaiah and um, kind of backtrack in one of the kings that or we looked at earlier this year. But Matthew chapter uh, 1 and uh, verse number 21, and she, the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, "Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us." And then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bid him, took uh, unto him. Uh, his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent uh, them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when, he is, when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And we're going to stop right there. Uh, we'll read a few more verses in just a minute. But I want, you, I want to um, set the stage here. And we know this story well, the story of the wise men coming. It's interesting to me, the ignorance of the religious, the ignorance of the religious. Did you notice that uh, they were expecting him to come? But when pressed upon it, they decided that they should do a little scripture searching and uh, find out what the scripture says, find out what the prophet said. And uh, they come up with the passage, by the way, of uh, verse number six is found in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, if you want to just jot down a little note there. And, um, but Micah chapter 5, verse number 2 is where that quote comes from. So we find that the, these people, and, and Herod himself, when we think about the response that Herod had, uh, Herod was a very self-centered man. Uh, he, was, he was very suspicious about Everybody around him, they thought he, he thought that uh, he thought that his own son was trying to steal his, uh, the kingdom from him. He thought that uh, he was he thought that people were always conspiring against him. He was a very suspicious man. So when he when these wise men come and say, "Hey, where's the king that's born of the Jews?" Uh, um, Herod's like, "What? Who is it? What are you talking about? Somebody's stealing my somebody. Wait, somebody is trying to steal my throne." Um, and so he he inquires. He calls the he calls the the priests together, and he says, "Hey, what is he talking about? And uh, when when is this Christ? When should this Christ be born?" And they tell him uh, the prophecy in Micah chapter five, verse number two. And then in verse number seven, this interesting phrase that often gets lost. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Well, oftentimes I thought, when I looked at that phrase, I thought, is he talking about when does the star appear in the sky at night? But what I believe is really what he's, what he's asking them, he's asking them, when did you first see this star? When, when did you first see it in the sky? Um, and that kind of lines up with Scripture. We see that later Herod, when he finds that, uh, that the wise men aren't coming back, he goes and he murders the children two years and under. And so it kind of points to the fact that Jesus was not an infant. You see, you see all the mangers where it's got the wise men. Uh, the wise men, they've come and Jesus has just been born. Probably wasn't so. Um, but, um, and so, and these verses kind of indicate that Herod was inquiring about how long the star had been in the sky that they were following. And, um, and then he kills the children two years and un under. And I, I, I do like these passages. We see the, the birth of Christ and how much scripture is fulfilled. Now I want to go back actually and in verse number 22 and 23 of chapter 1, uh, where it talks about, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah. And this is where this passage is found in Isaiah chapter 7. Could I get, honey, could you get me a drink, please? Isaiah chapter 7. The Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, 
the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up and up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Now, hold your place if you would. I want you to go back to Second Chronicles. And as we go back here, we're going to see, uh, hopefully you'll remember some of these things. Second uh, Chronicles 28. Second Chronicles 28, because what you what you're going to find here in Isaiah chapter in Isaiah chapter seven and the language that you hear Isaiah speak to King Ahaz is very pertinent to what was going on in King Ahaz's reign. Now, if you remember, Ahaz, Jotham was a Jotham was a a, 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 a great man, a great king. And uh, who loved the Lord, and the Bible says that he he uh, he prepared his ways before the Lord, his God. I don't know if you remember that message about preparing your way before the Lord. And but when Ahaz comes along, he decides that he doesn't want anything of what Daddy had. He doesn't want to follow God. He doesn't uh, he doesn't uh, care about God. And the Bible says in uh, chapter uh, chapter twenty eight. In verse number three, moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire. Notice that phrase. Underline that phrase. He burnt his children in the fire. I said it before, and uh, I'll say it again, that this, the sacrifices that they made to false gods, burning the children in the fire... Is, was basically was abortion. Uh, I don't want this kid, so we'll just sacrifice him to uh, this false god. And so, uh, and they believed that that would appease the gods and so forth. But it was just an early form of, uh, of abortion. And this is the attitude that Ahaz has. He, he has this attitude uh, that doesn't care about God and, and uh, the, the life of his children. Uh, the Bible says, after verse number three, after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out uh, before the children of Israel. Notice verse number four, very important. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And they smote him, carried away a great multitude of them captive, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered in the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Um, in verse number 8, the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, uh, sons and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So, Understand, Ahaz is a wicked man who wants nothing to do with God. And I want you to see in the prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 7. So it's told, verse number 2, to the house of David, that is Ahaz, saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. In other words, when they heard that the, are, are the northern tribes were coming against them, they were scared. They were afraid. And uh, he gives this picture of trees that uh, move with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou 
And Sher Jezshub, thy son. Okay, now I want you to understand here. He says, Isaiah, I want you to go speak to Ahab, or excuse me, Ahaz, and take your son. A son, by the way, we believe, was probably young. We're not talking about my age. We're talking about young. Uh, maybe four, maybe five, six, seven, eight years old. And I, I thought it when I, when I realized that what, he, what Isaiah, uh, talking to Ahaz and who I, Ahaz was, it was kind of interesting to me to think about the fact that here's a man who despised his own children, and God says, Isaiah, take your child with you when you go to talk to Ahaz. And um, so he takes his son, verse number, uh, verse number four, and, said, uh, and say unto him, take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, he's talking about uh, Ephraim and Syria, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Rem, uh, Remalia, because Syria and Ephraim and the son of Remalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel, then thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin within threescore, and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaiah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. And moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ai, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now remember who we're talking about here. We are talking about a man who hates God. And he... He's given, this, he's given this charge by Isaiah because understand Ahaz's mindset. Ahaz is in no position to take on these kingdoms. Ahaz, Ahaz has no power to defeat them. So in Ahaz's mind, he's thinking to himself, this is the end of Judah. This is the end of Jerusalem. It is done. It is finished. It's over with. And so he's just, he's just basically sitting back and saying, well, you know what? This is, this is done. This is it. This is the end. And God comes along and says, no, this isn't the end. This isn't the end of Judah because I have other plans. I have something else that I am planning to do. This is an interesting phrase, he says, he says, if ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. In other words, if you won't believe what the word of God says, what the, how the word of God has come to you, you will not be established. Your kingdom will not um, your, your, king, your kingdom will not last. But understand, Judah isn't done. I'm not done with Judah yet. And we know that to be true because Hezekiah comes along and takes over in place of Ahaz, and he's a great king. And God blesses Hezekiah. But um, he says this, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. In other words, Go to, ask God for proof. I want you to think about this. Here's a man who 
who was wicked before God. And yet God came along and said, prove me now. God came along and said, ask me to show you a sign. Because I'm ready to deliver. And so, Ahaz responds in, in his pride. He says, I will not ask. Neither will. Now, when you read that phrase, it kind of sounds like Ahaz is being super spiritual. Like saying, I'm not going to tempt God. I'm not going to test God. Like he's, like he's trying to be all super spiritual and, you know, I'm not supposed to do that. The, <laughs> you, you go back into the life of, and this was pointed out, I was reading a commentary on this. You go back to the life of David. Here was a man, when you look at the life of David, David was always asking God for proof. David was always looking to God for something. Ahaz comes along and he says, no, nope. ask because I don't want to tempt God. In verse number 13, he said, hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, or will ye weary my God also? In other words, there were, you think of it this way, there were people in the nation who were trying to do right, but here was a wicked king who was going the wrong direction. A wicked king who had forsaken God, and there were people that were trying to do right, but it was getting tiring. And they were, uh, they were, uh, uh, they, uh, they were uh, getting fed up with their king and the direction that he was going. And then he says, <laughs> and then Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask for a sign from God. And Isaiah says, will ye weary my God also? In other words, God had extended opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for Ahaz to get right, for God to prove himself to Ahaz. And Ahaz kept on saying, nope, 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 I want nothing to do with it. But we don't know why Ahaz had this attitude. I mean, he had seen a father who loved God. And for some reason, he was bitter and angry and upset and didn't want anything to do with God. And God was still there extending his mercy, extending his grace, extending... <laughs> and Ahaz, Isaiah was saying, how long are you going to resist God? How long are you going to push back against God? He is extending his mercy to you, and you uh, want nothing to do with it. And then comes that great prophecy. Verse number 13 is a small thing for you to weary men, but... Will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, as we know, God with us. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Stop right there for a second. I'm going to read a couple more verses uh, to you, but... I want you to think of that. Say, say, Brother Dan, how does this relate to what Ahaz was doing? Well, how does this relate to Judah? How does the prophecy about God coming, Jesus Christ coming, relate to what was happening in Judah's life? Or, or excuse me, in, in, um, in the nation of Judah, in Ahaz's life. Well, the lesson that we learn from it is this. Remember in John chapter 1, where the Bible says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I, I think of it this way. 
Ahaz, God was continually coming to Ahaz. Continually coming back to Ahaz, say, Ahaz, get right, get right, get right. It, it, prove me. I'll, I'll, I will prove myself to you. And Ahaz said, nope, 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 nope. I'm not going to do it. And even in the midst of all of that, even in the midst of all the rejection, we saw in Matthew chapter 2 how the religious leaders of the time didn't even know that Jesus was going to be, that was the time when Jesus was going to be born. And even in the midst of all that rejection, God said, I'm still coming to you. I'm still going to send my son. This will be the sign that God will dwell with you. In verse number, uh, verse number 15, butter and honey shall he eat. In other, words, in other words, he is going to be fully man. He is going to be God with you, God with us. He is going to be God Almighty in the flesh, but he will be fully man. He will suffer hunger. He will, he will have pain. He will be in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He will be fully man. You see, Ahaz refused the redemption. Ahaz refused the mercy of God. Ahab refused God's grace. He came to his own. He came, God came to his own. And his own would not receive him. But Jesus Christ, Jesus the Savior, God would send him, God would send himself anyway. So, so that we could have redemption. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In John chapter 1, and uh, this, this verse, I want to read this to his own. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to get, them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so God says, I'm extending my mercy and I'm extending my grace. I'm sending God to be, I'm sending myself to be with you. In verse number 16, and this was a little bit confusing to me. The Bible says, for before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, when you read that, it sounds like Isaiah is saying, well, the Messiah needs to become, come in Ahaz's time. But what he is talking about in verse number 16, remember I told you, Isaiah brought who, who along with him? His son. And so when Isaiah speaks in verse number 16, he's pointing to his son. His son. Before this child, the child shall know to refuse evil and to choose good, which means that his son was young. Before, in reality, he's saying before this child, Ahaz, and he gives him this prophecy, before this child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Talking about... Um, uh, talking about Syria and Ephraim. And so God, what God was saying was, in spite of you, I am going to work my plan. And what we need to understand, dear people of God, that God is working his plan in spite of us. He wants to, he wanted to include Ahaz in his plan. And he offered Ahaz the chance to get right and to follow him. 
and Ahaz refused. And we see in 2 Chronicles 28 that Ahaz suffers the consequences of it. But understand this, in spite of... Of the, the, uh, in spite of everything that the world tries to do, in spite of the things that we may try to do, God is still working his plan. If you will, go back with me to Matthew chapter number 2. This theme is followed through this story of the of the wise men, and I'm, I'll be done here in just a minute. Because Herod gets upset, and he's going to kill, he wants to kill Jesus. The Bible says in verse number 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, excuse me, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Herod, Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men. He was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, uh, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by a Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, would not be comforted because they are not. Herod, in his pride, in his arrogancy, in his fear, thought he could change the plans of God. Thought he could, thought he could uh, ruin God's plans. And God said, no, you're not ruining my plan. I say all that to say this. When God has a plan, first of all, it's a, first of all, think of it this way, it's an unexpected plan. In other words, think of it this way. God has a plan for your life. He has something that he wants to you to do. We get in our minds, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. But usually, when it's God's plan, it goes against everything that we think is logical. That we think we have my ways, God says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And so we think that we have a plan that how everything should fall in place. And God says, why don't you listen to the plan that I have? That's what he says to Isaiah. Listen to my plan. And I says, no, he says, nope, I don't want to hear it. And Isaiah suffers the consequences of it. But it's an unexpected plan. And secondly, it's an unchallenged plan. In other words, if you go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, God hath made everything beautiful in his time. And basically the Bible says, uh, it Bible says he has set everything in motion, everything in course, and he has planned everything out, and there's nothing that you're going to do to change that plan. God has a plan for this church and there's nothing that you can do to disrupt that plan. Now, God, it, it, we see that in the life of, and we see that in the nation of Judah. How Judah walked away from God, but God was not done with him. He was working out a greater plan. 
everything, think about everything that has happened in your life that brings you to this moment, to this point. Everything that you've gone through, maybe there have been, the, maybe there have been years you've been way away from God. Or maybe there's been times that you haven't been in church. Or maybe there have been uh, times that uh, you really w didn't have a walk with God. Or maybe there were times that uh, there was sin. Maybe there were things and circumstances in your life that changed things. And all of a sudden, you find yourself sitting here and now. God wasn't surprised by it. God, and that's not to say that, that's not to say that we don't have free will to make our own choices, but God being omniscient, knowing everything, he works his, he works his plan through our lives in spite of us. When God does something, I'll read this one verse and I'm done. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and in verse number 13. I love this verse. Verse number 14, excuse me. The Bible says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it can God do with it that men should fear before him. We will look around at our country. We look around at our circumstances. We look at around our country and we look around at this world and how crazy it's gone. I listened to Brother Ernie talk about everything that's happened in North Korea, or in, excuse me, South Korea. You've probably heard the news about what's happening in Australia. You, you hear the news about what's happening in our country. God has a plan. God has already worked out his plan. He knows his plan. And through his sovereignty, he works his plan in spite of us. That doesn't mean we don't have the free will to make our own choices. But God works his plan in spite of us. That's something I'll never understand how he does. How, how, how is it that we can all have our own free will and yet God is still working out his plan? I'll never understand it. But I know that it is real and I know that his plan never fails. No matter what I do in my life, that doesn't dissolve me of my responsibility to make the right choices as it did Ahaz. But understand this, that not one of us in here and not one of us, not, not a single person in this country or in another church or anything can disrupt the plans of God. The question is, are we going to be part of his plans or are we going to be like Ahaz and decide that we want to do our own thing. Whose side are you on? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would seal these things to our hearts. Lord, I pray that, uh, that we would seek wholeheartedly your plan and your will for our lives. That we would not be as Ahaz who uh, just who totally rejected you, but that we would seek your will and seek your face and seek the signs. Lord, you, you, you want to prove yourself to us. And I, I pray that we would be seeking you and seeking for that proof that you want to show your hand powerful in our lives and, uh, and powerful in this nation. Lord, we understand that you're working your will out every day. But I pray that we would want to be a part of that. We pray now that you'd see these things to our hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed to prayer.